we catch up with all things Catholic in the greater Houston area. We thank you so much for being able to join us for this one-hour program. There's a lot to cover, as we normally do every week, full of interviews as well as updates about things that are going on in the greater Houston area. But as with anything, we like to begin with prayer. Prayer sustains us here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. So if you join me, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hard to believe that it is already March the 4th, and we're at the third the week of the third Sunday of Lent already, and that Holy Week is fast approaching here at the end of March, but things are moving along swiftly here in 2024. We have a lot to let you know about, but a little bit of housekeeping off the top here of Catholic Lunch Break. We are excited to say that we are going to be broadcasting, once again this year, the annual Priests versus Seminarians basketball game. This is always a lot of fun for us, for both myself, for my colleague Tim Mott, David Magianis. Tickets for the seventh annual Priests versus Seminarians basketball game are on sale now via the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. So we hope that you'll join us for the event for the whole family can enjoy as the priests of the Archdiocese take on the Seminarians from St. Mary's Seminary. Again, all ticket sales benefit seminarians of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. We at KSHJ are looking forward again to broadcasting. This year, it's back at Rice University at the Tudor Fieldhouse. This year's game is Friday, April 19th. The game itself is at 7 o'clock, but there's going to be lots of tailgating going on as well. People are encouraged to show up a couple hours early around 5 o'clock, and it's going to be quite a lot of fun as it always is. One of the people that was celebrated last year was Father Ryan Stawways. He's a priest in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and he was celebrated for his life, and in particular, uh, for being able to always be open to loving God's will. And so there's a new film out that we want to let you know about. It's called Love God's Will. A beautiful film has been made in honor of the life of Father Ryan Stalways. Father Ryan graduated from St. Mary's Seminary, and he served as a priest in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and he did so diligently despite being diagnosed with cancer. So here's what's going on here for this particular program. We are going to give away some tickets for this new film, Love God's Will, Catholic film, right here made by local filmmakers. And if you want to have a chance to have a couple of tickets, we're going to give them away to some of our first callers. So here's what's going on. We're going to have a couple of showings that are coming up this Wednesday and Thursday at the Regal Cinemas, known as the Edwards Cinemas, on Wesleyan in Houston. We have a couple of showtimes, one this Wednesday at 630 and then Thursday at 630. So if you want a couple of tickets for free for Love God's Will, that's the film about Father Ryan, you can call in right now. It's at 877-757-9424. Again, if you want a couple tickets for the local film, 877-757-9424. Again, 877-757-9424. What you'll do is you call in and have a couple of options on what night you want to go there, and we'll get your information and put you on Will Call. So again, the name of the film is Love God's Will, and we're happy to be able to give away a couple of tickets to four callers for that movie as well. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this film, Love God's Will, and who Father Ryan is. And so that's why I'm honored right now to have here in our studio in Houston, Ray and Susan Stalways. They are Father Ryan's parents, and we appreciate their making the trip here to our studios all the way from uh, Magnolia, Texas, if I'm thinking correctly. Ray and Susan, welcome into the program. We appreciate you guys being here. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, I think this project, Love God's Will, about Father Ryan, was originally intended to be a short film here, again, made by local filmmakers. It ended up being a lot longer than just a short film. It's now 57 minutes in length. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your impressions about the film was to see the the final product and, and how it all turned out. What, what, again, started as a small interview, small project. Well, the Archdiocese of uh, Father Richard McNeely had actually a- approached us over a year ago and said he just wanted a little clip to put on the Vocations website. Okay. And as a result of that, he said, well, would you be open to having a film company, you know, look into this? Just a small little thing. We said, sure. Yeah. And then after they ended up 
interviewing people from all the places where Ryan had worked um, at St. Faustina and up at St. Anthony de Padua and at Prince of Peace, uh, they couldn't squeeze it into anything less than 57 minutes. Wow, that's amazing. And from what I understand, uh, Susan, a lot of people who knew Father Ryan were willing to sit down and do interviews with the filmmakers. In some cases, not always solicited. They just put the camera up and people say, hey, I want to talk about Father Ryan. Absolutely. And uh, Samilla, who's the executive producer of the hmm. film, she had actually ended up having to set up Sign Up Geniuses. There were so many people who were calling the church offices saying, I want to be a part of this. And so she would set this up on several Sundays in the little bridal chapel off to the side, a uh, little <laughs> bridal room, and uh, set up all of their equipment and interview people, uh, just one after the other after the other. And it went all day long for several weekends. Okay, so the film itself has a lot of those interviews. People know Father Ryan, love Father Ryan as well. But it's not just that. You guys had a lot of home movies as well. So my understanding is that Samella and Jesse, who are the, the filmmakers, had to sort through... Uh, a, a lot of home videos. Tell me a little about what all you had of, of Father Ryan. Years and years, 25 years of home movies. Everything from when he was young to high school, college. And I had not seen those for 25 years because I had filmed them on a dinosaur camcorder mm -hmm. and, you know, never really had them, <laughs> uh, you know, changed over to any other type of, of media. And um, so that was a real gift for us to be able to actually see those for the first time when we were there March 2nd watching these beautiful, beautiful films as them as even very young, praying with their dad. Sure, very good. So Father Ryan was born in August of 1989. He went to be with the Lord in June of 2021. Uh, Ray, I want to ask you about, about your son. Um, did, did you think he always knew he had a calling for the priesthood? Did he always feel like he was close to God? How did that sort of evolve over time? So as a youngster... Uh, you know, we prayed as a family, um, but, you know, as he states, until he went to college, um, Texas A&M, <laughs> Got to get the shout-out to the Aggies, yeah, which, right? I'm not an Aggie, but I'm, I'm uh, you know. Right. Anyway, uh, so he, uh, he said he started to gain a personal relationship with God, and uh, he served on a Ag Awakening, and... Um, and he just felt called to that, and um, he had a first bout of cancer, which stopped him for a year from graduating mm -hmm. uh, as a petroleum engineer. And um, when he came back, uh, when he was able to go back to school, um, he came in after he graduated, and he said, you know, Dad, I think uh, God's calling me for something else. And uh, I kind of said, hey, you know, um, I wasn't listening, I guess. He said, uh, I, I, I said, you know, son, just because you won this battle with cancer, I don't think God's calling you to give your life to the priesthood. And he said, no, Dad, it's not my decision. Wow. God called me. God's calling me. So, yeah, he, yeah, that was it. And he, he just blasted forth. And I imagine that was especially difficult for you guys, not just, you know, all, all the pressure of just him being able to go to the seminary and do all the duties that he had to do and sort of the self-sacrifice that takes to be a priest, but the fact that he was also battling cancer the whole time and still willing to do it. You know, that, um, that was just a part of his life. That didn't interfere. I mean, it slowed down certain things, but that wasn't a de definition of who he was. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. It's okay. I want to read a quote from him that, that um, kind of stays with me a little bit. Father Ryan's quoted as saying, Be open, be trusting. Though we may be wounded, God can accomplish his will through you. In our weakness, he becomes our strength. Learn to love God's will. In your life, um, Susan, what? Tell me, what kind of example do you think Father Ryan serves for us? You know, as Catholics, as people go about our day to day, um, what are the lessons that we can take from his life? Do you think? Trust, trust was the big one. Um, 
when he was uh, re-diagnosed with cancer just six weeks before ordination, uh, he had approached several people. He, he was talking to his fellow seminarians about, you know, the confusion of why this is now, why is this cancer back now? I'm just getting ready to start a new life in the priesthood. And the, it, it took him a little while, I think. He never discussed it really with us too much. Um, seminarians talked to us about this after he died, that mm-hmm. he just said, I am going to keep going. I know what my job is. This isn't going to make a difference to me. I'm just going to continue what I'm doing. And I, I think his obedience to... Um, he, he knew that no matter what he was going to do with the very next breath, with the very next hour, that it was going to be given to God. He was joining himself in suffering with Christ, trying to do reparation for souls, trying to be that priest, you know, that he he set out to be. Uh, during, as I mentioned, the they have the priest versus seminarians basketball game, mm-hmm. and he had played at that, uh, certainly when he was in the seminary, but then also when he was a priest as well. Uh, and last year's game was dedicated for to, to him, and I know he's been mentioned before as well. Um, what did that mean to you, Susan, that, that he was honored specifically? I was blown yeah. away. Father Preston called me on the phone, and of course, he and Ryan had chatted about starting the priest versus seminary game as years ago. And for them to want to take this extra step, it wasn't only about dedicating it to him, calling it the Father Ryan Stallways Priest vs. Seminary and Basketball Game. Mm-hmm. But he also had warm-ups made, and all of the players wore these warm-ups when they came out, and they all had Stallways on the back of the shirt, mm-hmm. and they all had his number on it. And, uh, well, you know, my Mama gets sentimental. <laughs> And I just, uh, you could feel the love, and um, to generate so much love, that was amazing to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ray, I want to ask you just about uh, being a parent, um, because, you know, again, uh, having a son who passed away, I can only imagine, is is so difficult for, for any parent. Um, but in this particular case, like I said, because he... he Father Ryan was so involved with the community. Mm-hmm. Um, that sort of makes an interesting dynamic as well for parents out there who might be going through a similar experience. Uh, they might have a son or a daughter who's been diagnosed with cancer. Um, what advice do you have for parents out there when they might feel lost? Like I said, not all families necessarily prayed as much as you guys did with, with Father Ryan growing up. W- what advice, what would you tell those those parents out there? Well, you know, Sue has had a number of battles with cancer as well, mm-hmm. and uh, and Ryan and her kind of had a pact that, you know, the definition of their life wasn't going to be a a prognosis, and I think that, you know, you live every day, you're in the moment, mm-hmm. and God provides. Um, there was never, you know. There was anxiety over maybe not being able to, to contribute as much. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it is a life worth living. Absolutely, absolutely. If you're just now joining us on the program, you're listening to Catholic Lunch Break. This is the program where we catch up with all things Catholic in the greater Houston area. This is Wyatt Goolsby, the executive director of this radio station. We're talking with Ray and Susan Stawways. Their son, Father Ryan, is the subject of a brand new local film. It's called Love God's Will, and we're very happy and honored to be able to give away some movie tickets for the upcoming two upcoming showings. We've got a couple there coming on this Wednesday and this Thursday at the Regal Cinemas, Edward Cinemas on Wesleyan Street in Houston. So if you want to get a couple tickets to be able to go to one of those showings, call in right now. The phone number is 877-757-9424. Again, 877-757-9424. Call in and say you're interested in Love God's Will is the name of the film as well. And not only are they having it in Houston, but all over the greater Houston area within this month of March, they're having a number of showings at movie theaters. So be sure to look up Palomita Films for more on that. Before I let 
Ray and Susan Stalways go, I just want to ask you guys one more thought about the film and why people who are local should see it. Like I mentioned before, it turned out to be a little bit bigger film. It turned out to be 57 minutes when it was supposed to be a short one. Um, what Do you guys have any favorite parts of the film or parts that in particular stood out to you? And I'll let you guys both take a moment just to answer that. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that the film is actually now going to be shown in San Antonio, also at Texas A&M. Uh, we're working on UT, and it's going to be at University of St. Thomas. Uh, we have some inquiries from Canada, okay. one from Australia. So we're not real sure where this is going, Wyatt. I don't know. <laughs> um, there's also a possibility of having a booth up at the Eucharistic Congress, somebody was suggesting. So we're mm. just open to if anybody's interested in Bringing it to your area, there is a place on palomitafilms.com where you can actually fill in your information and somebody will reach out to you. Okay. As far as my favorite part, I think it is when, I'm not going to give it away altogether, but um, mm -hmm. when you see um, them laying on the floor with their dad and they're uh, praying, that's, that's my favorite. That's absolutely my favorite. Oh, dancing in the kitchen is nice too. Was that, a, was that a home video? Yeah, <laughs> I hadn't seen it in such a long time. Thank but you, the uh, other thing is is how beautifully Palomita Films wove uh, Ryan's youth and how God preps us in our young age with practicing skills and things and how he uses them later on in life. They wove all that in to it beautifully. Excellent. Ray, what about you? Any favorite parts? or I guess there's so many parts that probably stand out in the film. Yeah, I think uh, the a good part for me was... Uh, watching some film the way they tied in a basketball him mm -hmm. uh you know you guys were actually i think it's you guys were moderating the game and they and they you, you say and there's ryan coming down to court and there's actually like a ditto when he was like eight years old and it switches from one to the other <laughs> and uh and and then when i think about the priest and the seminarians basketball game i think about how many confessions have to be heard after that game because <laughs> those guys play to win. And they do. it is a very, very uh, just great game, I think. It's just, you know, looking at priests and seminarians that are real people doing their best. So that, that to me was my favorite. Amen. Very good. Well, again, we want to encourage people both to check out Love God's Will as well as the Priest versus Seminarians basketball game, which, again, is Friday, April 19th, back at Rice University this year. Again, we're going to continue here on Catholic Lunch Break to offer some of those tickets for people who want to call in. Again, 877-757-9424. For now, we're going to take a break, but in the meantime, I just want to thank Ray and Stu Susan Stalways for coming all the way in for our studio to talk about Love God's Will. Thank you both so much for joining us here on Catholic Lunch Break. Thank, thank you, Wyatt. Wyatt, for this opportunity. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this break. This is Father Joseph Paul Alban, pastor of Holy Rosary in Midtown Houston, encouraging you to give the gift of life. We're partnering with M.D. Anderson to host a blood drive on Sunday, March 17th. Come to Mass and donate blood after. The blood drive will be on the second floor of our parish hall from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can book an appointment online through M.D. Anderson or by calling 713-792-7777. Again, that's Sunday, March 17th at Holy Rosary in Midtown Houston. Treat your family and yourself to a delicious seafood dinner this Lent. The St. Rosa Lima Men's Club is hosting a fish fry Friday, March 22nd. The plates are plentiful and are only $13. The dinner menu includes a generous portion of catfish and coleslaw, hush puppies, fries, and a drink. You can dine in or take your order to go. St. Rosa Lima Men's Club Fish Fry, Friday, March 22nd from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. For more information, go to stroslima.org. Southeast Houston Cardiology is a proud sponsor of this Guadalupe Radio Network station and The Doctor Is In with Dr. Ray Garendi. Southeast Houston Cardiology has been serving patients with heart disease and vascular disease with up-to-date, compassionate, and comprehensive care for more than 20 years. Southeast Houston Cardiology has two locations, Webster and Pasadena. You can contact them online at southeasthoustoncardiology.com or 281-338-4004. The Catholic Lunch Break is underwritten in part by Loving Choice Catholic Pregnancy Help Center. Guided by the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Catholic Church, Loving Choice extends God's love in the form of emotional, educational, material, and spiritual support to parents and families as they embrace the challenges 
and the blessings for an unplanned pregnancy. Loving Choice is a place any woman can go for help and information when she is facing an unexpected, emotional, and possibly scary situation. She can take advantage of a free pregnancy test, they perform free ultrasounds, and the volunteers at Loving Choice will listen and provide compassionate options without judgment or pressure. You could be one of those volunteers. Find out more at loving-choice.org. Always make the loving choice. Welcome back to Catholic Lunch Break on the Guadalupe Radio Network. This is Wyatt Goolsby, the Executive Director of KSHJ. That's the Guadalupe Radio Network station right here in Houston, Texas. This program, Catholic Lunch Break, catches you up with all things Catholic in the greater Houston area. And one of the things that we like to do here is highlight the pro-life movement and pro-life initiatives in the greater Houston area. And so we normally check in with Loving Choice. That's the only Catholic Pregnancy Pro-Life Pregnancy Center here in the greater Houston area. And so joining us on the phone is John Hinojosa. He's the Executive Director of Loving Choice. The office there is located in Spring. John, welcome back on Catholic Lunch Break. Uh, appreciate your, your being on. How is everything uh, so far with the last couple of weeks since I last spoke to you at Loving Choice? Matt, first of all, thank you for having us uh, again, White. And uh, I tell you what, it seems like yesterday, but things are just really a lot of activity and we're just overall generally we're seeing a lot more uh women uh, facing uh, unplanned pregnancies and situations like that coming in at such a rapid rate over over the entire uh uh schedule of days that we're open so it's uh, it's really exciting to see that uh, we're able to be of assistance to more people Sure. Well, tell me, John, what are some of the common questions that you get? Again, you might get a situation where a woman, for example, come in, she's pregnant, might not have a lot of resources, might not know what to do. Uh, what are the common things that you try to let them know about or maybe to alleviate uh, pressure or concern or anxiety? Well, I think uh, one key thing, and I think it was touched on in that um, aforementioned uh, little spot on, on Love and Choice is that Everyone that comes in here, and, and, and many have commented, uh, clients have come through, or do they, uh, doors have said and stated many times over that, uh, wow, the loving compassion I feel, uh, non-judgmental uh, you are and in all that you do, and, and I, this is a different kind of place. We really feel the love, and we just truly believe without that, nothing can go forward. And, and so uh, aside from all the wonderful services we do, and all the great things that are happening, all the little miracles that God is allowing to happen there, uh, we're just extending that love and giving the hope uh, to those ladies who find themselves in, in, in seemingly hopeless situations. So we do let them know, you are not alone. You are not alone. And we're not just referring up to choosing life up to the point of you having your baby. But after that, we're with you. We're going to give you continue to give you that guidance, support, and love throughout uh, the child or the infant up to three years, four years if possible, if needed, uh, of their life and working uh, with uh, and collaborating with other agencies or uh, family types, life affirming agencies and, and ministries out there. So we're about, you know, doing what we say and say what we do, but showing them that love first and foremost. Absolutely. You talked about before, John, when you were on that you guys are, are always trying to being able to offer new services, better services to those women who come in. You had talked about getting some ultrasound machines. Uh, tell me about the power of an ultrasound machine. What does it do? What's the impact when uh, a woman sees the, the results of that? Well, the impact uh, is, uh, I, I sometimes just say it's inexplicable. I can't explain in words because it's a very emotional moment. I, I being male, I'm not, I don't, uh, I'm not able to be a chaperone or, be an assistant of any kind inside the actual room. But I do get to see the tears of, of joy come in when they do come out of the, the sonography room and with the sonographers that we have. Uh, many come in not really having full clarity that, that it really is life that's within them. Uh, and so a lot of transformation, a lot of conversion, uh, many have gone in. And to have the type of equipment that we do have with the – we have some of the most advanced and the latest uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, ultrasound machines that we acquired recently, mm -hmm. but to also couple that with a, a, just a great visual screen so they can really, really see something uh, of great clarity and see that 
even the heart beating. And uh, when when a mom sees that, a uh, wife, you got to know, uh, that's just so impactful and such an emotional experience. In many of our ladies, we, we're, we're, sending, we're seeing generally uh, less women choosing uh, what we hope and pray that they don't is to, to, to you know, choose the, the path of abortion. On the contrary, we're seeing more choosing life. And that is a lot of, a bit attributed to, obviously, love and prayer and compassion, but also the equipment and the technology that we're able to, to deliver them to see their baby. And I think it's also important to note that for those women who come in, the clients, that they don't have to worry necessarily about the cost. How are you guys able to do that and stay afloat when the women don't necessarily have to worry about the cost of all of those, you know, detailed, uh, you know, programs and things that they would have to do? Sure. Well, you are part. You all are part of that quotient and Guadalupe Radio. You help us uh, project the, the message out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're able to do it because we have very uh, little to none in terms of expenses for employees. Ninety-five uh, percent of the people that are in a uh, house in, the, in our ministry in the office are all volunteers, and first and foremost. And we have professionals from from nurse, nurse practitioners to school teachers to retired bankers. So they're very knowledgeable people. We train them highly, so, but that doesn't cost it. Come at a cost. Our pregnancy tests, everything uh, is, is at no cost, but because of donors too. So mm-hmm. I always refer to prayer first and foremost. We can't do anything without prayer and support, and and uh, but we also have a lot of wonderful uh, supporters who give who tithe and give uh, so so graciously to uh, and it, it may be the five dollars, it may be more, but it all adds up and it's able to keep our lights on, keep mm-hmm. us functional, and do all the wonderful things that we continue to do. And I'm so thankful because God is, it's just so great. It's it's just so awesome to see the community come together and support us with initiatives that we're, we continue to do. And we're getting bigger and offering more services uh, to our clients like never before. Very good. Well, we are at the Guadalupe Radio Network are happy to partner with you guys and be able to promote that pro-life message. Obviously, we are a pro-life radio station and happy to continue to uh, push that message, which is needed in this day and age. John, just to recap here, uh, if people want to learn more about Loving Choice, if there's a woman who's in a a situation where she needs help, how can she reach out and contact you guys and learn more? Well, the most uh, most uh, accessible way that people do, because it has all of our information, is uh, access our website, to, uh, which is www.loving-choice.org. That's um, loving-choice.org, and we have pages that are in Spanish and lots in English as well. We have a bilingual staff. We're here to serve. You can call us basically 24 hours, and we will get your message within if we don't answer right then and there, but, and we'll return the call within 24 hours if it's on a weekend or something like that. We are here to serve the entire Archdiocese, uh, Archdiocese of Galveston Houston community. So please know that we are about service. And, why, and next month, the beginning of April, I'm going to make a, a great announcement that uh, a launch uh, of an initiative that we're going to do. We're going to set out to help uh, women all over the archdiocese. So our big 10 county area, I think it is. Uh, so mm-hmm. look forward to that. <laughs> Very good. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that for April. And we'll, uh, we'll be happy to kind of break the news there in April. So we'll look yeah. forward to that and, and checking in with you uh, there at the beginning of April. And again, we'll continue to check in in the weeks ahead uh, with more folks, volunteers and employees there at Loving Choice. John Hinojosa, Thanks. Executive Director at Loving Choice. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you, and thank you for all that y'all are doing. As I mentioned before, Holy Week is fast approaching. A lot of holy days here in the month of March. It's hard to imagine that uh, Easter is fast approaching, but we want to be able to kind of break down all of the important things that are going on during the liturgical season. We normally do that in a segment we call Smells and Bells. We normally play some bells right now. It looks like we're having trouble getting our having trouble getting our gnat sound there. But we welcome into the program Father Stephen Reynolds. He's a regular here. Father Father Reynolds, do you want to do some pretend bells noise just to get us started I, with I, this? I, I, I don't think I could do them justice. No, yeah. <laughs> not exactly. Uh, One more thing to give up for Lent. There, there you go. Excellent. Very good. So. Third uh, week of the third Sunday of Lent, Father Reynolds, yes. a lot, a lot is coming up with uh, Holy Week. That's probably the big liturgical thing that's on our mind. True. Uh, but I want to start off with just asking you one 
question to, to define one thing, and that is the term passion tide, because I sure. keep hearing that, and I, I try and figure out, break that down for us, what that means. Yes, well, passion tide refers to the last couple of weeks of Lent, uh, the time of the, um, uh, the church focuses more intently liturgically upon the passion of the Lord. So that all of Lent is really a preparation, uh, ultimately to renew our baptismal promises at the Easter Vigil or on Easter Sunday, or for the, the catechumens now called the elect, who will be baptized at the Easter Vigil. And for us who have already been baptized, you know, we have a, this opportunity for renewal, and we see that you know, Lent involves a spiritual pilgrimage, and that's reflected liturgically, culminating in Holy Week and in the week before, which is, um, which is traditionally called Passion Tide, although it's not a, an official liturgical season. It is a part mm-hmm. of Lent. And it has its origins in the older arrangement of the liturgical calendar when uh, the fifth Sunday of Lent was called Passion Sunday and the, the following Sunday, Palm Sunday. So Passion Tide began with the fifth Sunday of Lent. Hmm. And so it's the final two weeks of that season, which encompasses Holy Week as well. And so it's still unofficially referred to as Passion Tide, and it's marked by one significant exterior um, sign, and that is the covering of images and crucifixes in the church. Something's not required. It's optional, but many churches do it, or at the very least, they'll cover their crucifix. And this stems from the the reading that was read on that fifth Sunday of Lent, again, back before the 1960s, from, from, uh, from Matthew, I think it's Matthew, Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe John, chapter 8, uh, verses, um, verse, verse 51 to 59, I think, when it spoke about Jesus, who was confronted by his enemies, then removing himself and going into hiding. And so that was signified by covering the images of the Lord. And, of course, if he went into hiding, the other disciples would have gone into hiding as well. Again, this is a sign that Jesus is in control, really. He's the master of the passion. He's not just swept along by events beyond his control. And so even though that reading is now given on the Thursday of the fifth week of Lent, we still can commemorate that time, and it's a very, I think, profoundly uh, significant symbol to have these images covered in the church because it's a rather shocking reminder when people come in mm-hmm. that things that we've turned the corner things are changing and we're going deeper it's becoming more serious and it's very uh, dramatic in our parish church at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton because we have these large paintings and on either side of a not quite life-size crucifix and they're all covered with these huge purple cloths as well as the crucifix on the altar and the other few statues we have in the church. So it makes it quite a dramatic scene, uh, and many churches do as, as well. And, you know, if your parish church does not do that, maybe all it takes is for a few people to volunteer next year mm-hmm. to, to make the cloths, to make the coverings, and to, and, to, uh, and to be the ones to do the work to cover everything. Because if one hasn't made those preparations in advance, it's kind of hard to do it at the last minute. Well, I, I agree with you, Father Reynolds, that that definitely has an impact. You walk into a church and to see all of the images like the saints covered, yes. uh, it really reminds you that it's that we're, we're arriving, we're co- close to that Easter time. And it feels like there's a lot of preparation. We have a lot of Lent, and then we have leads into Holy Week, all the way it lead up to Easter. W- why do you think it's so important that we have all of these holy days and, and this time to prepare for, for, for Easter Sunday? Well, you know, when, when we look at our own lives— we're not converted generally on the spot. Now, there are dramatic examples in Christian history and even in the scriptures of instantaneous conversions. St. Paul, for example, and Matthew at you know, his uh, customs table, and there were others. But most, and even after those dramatic moments, each of those individuals still had to grow in faith. And so, you know, we mark our growth in faith over the course of, you know, many different years, and we're always in need of conversion and reversion and deepening, but it, it doesn't happen typically overnight or in one instance. It happens gradually, and we may not even notice when it's happening. And so the fact that Lent unfolds slowly 
is kind of a, again, a liturgical sign to us that we have to be patient, stick with the course, and uh, to be attentive to the ways God may be moving us and, and directing us in the course of our life or just in the course of a day. You know, one of the characteristic liturgical elements of Lent is that it involves a gradual stripping away of externals. I, we probably talked about this um, last month, that you know, we, we, we lose some elements of the Mass. Uh, the Gloria disappears, except on solemnities. The Alleluia is set aside and even kind of symbolically buried, as we do it in our parish. On, the, on that Shrove Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. And then the color of the vestments changes to purple. We, we leave aside uh, adornments on the altar so there are no candles. And this music is more simple. And we don't use instruments except to support the music. And so there's more silence and the, other things as well. And then, of course, at Passion Tide, the images are removed. And then on Holy Thursday, the bells are removed after the Gloria, and then on Good Friday, even the Mass is removed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it all comes back and with a kind of explosive force on, at the Easter Vigil. And so that kind of liturgical external stripping away is a model and a sign that that has to be happening in our own soul, spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rich and helpful season for us. Um, to, uh, and, of course, it's a, one time of the year when we take on an external sign on Ash Wednesday when we're mm -hmm. signed with ashes. Uh, so all of these things are meant to contribute and reinforce in us the fact that God is working even when we're not or even when we're not aware of it. And to be patient and to try to cooperate with the grace of God as it flows into our life. And all of this in eager anticipation of Holy Week, which, as I mentioned, is fast approaching. Yes. Well, Holy Week is uh, right around the corner. And Palm Sunday, which is also called the the Palm Sunday, the Passion of the Lord, is a significant point in Lent. It begins Holy Week, so it's one week before Easter. Easter is the last day of March this year. And, uh, and during Holy Week, not only do we begin with this reenactment of the Lord entering into Jerusalem, by carrying palms ourselves, the palms that will next year be made into the ashes mm -hmm. that will be placed on our foreheads. It evokes uh, Jesus entering Jerusalem, which is, which is contained in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we also hear the reading of the Passion for the first time. So we hear the Passion twice during Holy Week. The second time is on Good Friday. It's always taken from the Gospel of John on Good Friday. But on, on Palm Sunday, it's taken from the gospel in whose that appears in our current cycle. So this year it's Mark. So it's the shortest version of the Passion. And it's distinctive because it's typically read in parts, and the, the faithful will often have a part that they will, um, that they will say together with the other, uh, the other proclaimers. And then Tuesday of Holy Week, we, in our diocese we celebrate the Chrism Mass. And that's the Mass in which the Cardinal blesses the holy oils that are used throughout the year, the oil of the sick and the oil of catechumens, the oils that are used in the various sacraments, and also consecrates the sacred chrism, which is the oil that is used at baptism, at confirmation, and in holy orders. And the church provides that the chrism mass would typically be celebrated on Holy Thursday morning. That almost never happens mm -hmm. because, because that is such a, a busy day in the parish, the priest would not be able to attend and then still uh, take care of all the arrangements for, for Holy Thursday evening, which we'll get to in a moment. So most dioceses celebrate the Chrism Mass earlier in Holy Week, and we, our custom is to celebrate it the Tuesday of Holy Week. It'll be at 7 o'clock in the evening at the Co-Cathedral of the Sacred Heart downtown. Anyone can attend. It is open to all the faithful. The only piece of advice I would give is show up nice and early if you'd like a convenient parking spot, because you know Absolutely. how parking can be around the cathedral, mm -hmm. uh, especially during the on a on a on a work day. But during that mass, there'll be ne a number of priests will be present. We'll easily have a hundred priests from around the archdiocese, maybe more, uh, maybe 150, because not only are the oils blessed and the chrism consecrated, but the priests of the archdiocese renew their priestly commitment. Mm -hmm. that was made at the ordination. 
So just as all of us together renew the promises of our baptism at Easter on the, at the Chrism Mass, which is symbolically on Holy Thursday, the, the priests also renew the, the, their priestly commitment. And so it's a beautiful you know, it's a beautiful Mass, and it's a beautiful ceremony, and it, uh, it ties us in so directly and profoundly with all that's going to unfold in Holy Week. And during the sacred triduum, which is another, you know, Lenten uh-huh. phrase, which refers to the three days of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, the sacred triduum, the holy, the three holy days yeah. of the kind of final push for Lent. And everything is culminating because liturgically we're, we're bringing to mind again the passion of the Lord, his burial, and then his glorious resurrection. And that's marked by the mass of the of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday and the procession with the Holy Eucharist to the place of reservation. So this commemorates the Last Supper. It's not a reenactment of the Last Supper, mm-hmm. but it commemorates the beginning of the institution of the Eucharist, which only, is only completed upon the cross. And then Good Friday, of course, the day, only day of the year without Mass. Although Holy Communion is distributed in the, in the liturgy of that day, we have the reading of the Passion again mm-hmm. and the veneration of the cross. Very moving ceremony. Absolutely. And it's, I think, Father Reynolds, this is a reminder that, you know, while going to your Sunday obligation the Sunday before, and then obviously on Easter Sunday is what required of Catholics, it's important to remember that, that you have all these other liturgical celebrations the whole week that you don't right. need to necessarily just worry about what's your obligation, but what else can you go to if you can go to a Station of the Cross or one of these other Masses that you're talking about throughout the week? Well, that's true. It, and, you know, we want to have a, a very rich understanding of the church's liturgy and its capacity really to expand our hearts more and more to the mystery of God that's put before us in the liturgy. Sometimes it's a little tough if we're older or if we have lots of little kids that we have to try to Mm -hmm. wrangle together. Um, And I would just say it's worth the effort. If we can make it, it's worth the effort. I had a, I was in one parish some years ago and there was a couple who had four or five. They have more than that now four or five little kids, but they never miss the Easter vigil. Hmm. And in most parishes, the Easter vigil is not packed. It's comfortably full in many places, but they always sat near the back and took two pews off to Mm -hmm. the side, two short pews. The parents would sit in one pew with a couple of the older kids, and then the the little ones, they would just bring a blanket and a pillow and put them (laughs) to sleep Yeah, and uh, because the parents really wanted to experience the vigil and – didn't bother me if the kids were in the back sleeping. The apostles were sleeping. Right. You know, on Holy Thursday, a lot of us sleep through important things. And, of course— uh, No judgments. No judgments. No, of course. And the little ones, well, <laughs> you're, we're happy that they're getting some rest at that moment. A- absolutely. Uh, speaking of little ones and speaking of parish life, uh, Father Reynolds, I do want to credit you for, for something really quickly. You are the pastor at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Catholic Church, right. which is located in Houston. And I want to give credit to some of the students there, the the Lady Finns, the basketball team, girls basketball team, because they recently won the uh, won the basketball championship. And so I just want to give credit to, to them. Well, and, they, they worked really hard and they have a fine coach. Oh, that's right. also associated with this radio station. I do have to mention David Magianis uh, is our GRN business manager as well. Uh, I think uh, Carol is actually bringing in the, the championship oh, uh, yeah, there trophy there. I guess, Carol, do you want to put that right next to Father Riddle? I had to way? remind David that's the property of the school. It is. He's got, he gets he's really showing, ex- David, He's showing it coach. off while he can. He's the coach. Yeah, he's been bringing this in well, you know, to, to, to brag about this. Uh, there you he, go. Let's see if you can get a good well, shot worked, of that. He worked really hard. And uh, – He's yeah. proud of the girls, and they and they really performed well. The boys did well. They mm-hmm. ended up in the top three, yes. the final three, but they didn't quite uh, push it through to the end. But they also are to be commended. But it's nice to have a champion. Yeah, there you go. In the house. It, it, I, Speaking I, of a champion, let me mention sure. that in a few days, we're having the relics of St. Jude the Apostle okay. in our parish. On March the 15th, the Ides of March, uh, this national pilgrimage of the uh, some of the major relics of St. Jude brought from Rome have been in pilgrimage around the country. They're coming to St. Elizabeth and Seton on Friday, March the 15th from 2 p.m. until 10 p.m. And there'll be public veneration of the relics. People can approach them, won't be able to touch them directly, but we'll be able to pro- approach and pray in the presence of, of the relics of this great apostle who's often invoked for impossible causes. 
are very difficult causes. In fact, if you go to the website apostleoftheimpossible.com, mm-hmm. apostleoftheimpossible.com, you can get information about that pilgrimage and about the schedule. I believe there will be five parishes in Houston that will host the relics. We'll be the first on March 15th from 2 to 10 p.m. St. Elizabeth Van Seton Church up in Cypher. And Ma- Mass will be celebrated at 7 p.m. Of for sure. in, in honor of and in thanksgiving for the witness of St. Jude the Apostle. So everyone's welcome. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your mentioning that, Father Reynolds. I've been meaning to put together a 30-second spot to put on the radio here to promote that as well because it's always uh, it's always uh, a joy and something special whenever you have a holy relic coming through town because people can go and venerate it. And like I said, it's just an opportunity to grow closer to God, especially during this time. Yes, Absolutely. Very good. Excellent. Well, it, can I just mention, I, I imagine for you as a priest, it's, it's a joy not only to be the pastor of a church, but also to have a school with students like that at St. Elizabeth Ann Seat. Oh, sure. The kids are great. Their families are wonderful. We have excellent teachers, and um, the kids take their education very seriously, and that's thanks to their teachers and their parents. So um, if you're interested, come give us a call. We're happy to give you a tour of the school. Excellent. Very good. Father Stephen Reynolds here in our regular Smells and Bells segment. We appreciate your coming in and telling us uh, a little bit about uh, the Holy Days here in the month of March. Great. We'll have a blessed remainder of Lent. Amen. Very good. Well, coming up after the break, the University of St. Thomas here in Houston is unveiling a new program that promotes the authentic Catholic teaching on men and women. We'll have more on that coming up just after this break. Where do we come from and where are we going? Why do we have all these hungers in our hearts and what are we supposed to do with them? Hello, this is Dr. Christopher West from the Theology of the Body Institute. Join me at St. Helen Catholic Church in Pearland as we'll be addressing these questions and more at a very special event called Made for More. And it's gonna be held March 21st and tickets are only $25. They are available by going to our website, theologyofthebody.com and then go to the events, click on Pearland and register today. Join us at St. Michael the Archangel Catholic Church on Sage Road for the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo will be presenting on the Eucharist and the early church fathers on Monday, March 4th at 7 p.m. And Bishop Stephen Lopes will be presenting on the Mass on Tuesday, March 5th. Wednesday, March 6th, you're welcome to join us for reconciliation and confession. All activities will be held in the church at 7 p.m. Come to St. Michael the Archangel, March 4th and 5th. Join hundreds of Catholics on Good Friday to walk the way of the cross. The two-mile procession starts at the University of St. Thomas at 1015 on Good Friday, March 29th. The group will walk from UST's Chapel of St. Basil to the Co-Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in downtown Houston. The way of the cross includes five stations, gospel readings, and reflections. That's the way of the cross starting at UST at 1015 a.m. on March 29th. Fridays in Lent are for fish fries. Join the Knights of Columbus at St. Luke the Evangelist. Dine in or take out at St. Luke's for just $15 a plate. That's right, $15 a plate. Fish, fries, hush puppies, coleslaw, corn on the cob, and iced tea. You can also buy homemade desserts from the Catholic Daughters. That's Friday fish fry in Lent at St. Luke's for 15 bucks. The Knights of Columbus are looking forward to seeing you there. God bless. Hello, Houston. You are listening to Catholic Lunch Break, the weekly program where we break down all things Catholic in the greater Houston area with interviews, updates, as well as announcements. My name is Wyatt Goolsby. I'm the executive director of this radio station, KSHJ AM 1430. Want to mention one last time, we are giving away tickets for an upcoming film. It's a local film. It's called Love God's Will. It's all about Father Ryan Stawways, and it's a 57-minute film. We have a couple show times where we can give away two tickets for a caller. So if you want to call in right now, the show times are going to be this Wednesday and this Thursday, and they're about they're 630. And both of those shows, by the way, are sold out. So the only way to get tickets right now is if you call in. The number call in right now is 877 877- 757-9424, 877-757-9424. Here's what's going on this Wednesday and Thursday at the Regal Cinema, Edward Cinema on Wesleyan in Houston is going to have a couple showings of Love God's Will. Again, it's at 630 on Wednesday and Thursday night, so we have some tickets to give away for that. So if you're in the Houston area and want to go and check out 
the uh, beautiful film by local Catholic filmmakers. Again, the name of the film is Love God's Will. You can look that up online. It's by Palomita Films. And again, the phone number to call in to get some free tickets is 877-757-9424. Here on the Guadalupe Radio Network, we like to promote Catholic education. Catholic education is so important and foundation for so many people who are looking to grow closer to God, both as young age and as they get older as well. That's why we like to regularly have a sports report. And so this week we have it uh, an update from Valeria Lopez. Hello, it's Valeria from Crystal Ray here, rolling out your Catholic high school sports report for the Houston area. So let's start with boys baseball. St. Thomas Eagles took the victory against Mansfield Knights, and straight Jesuit Fighting Crusaders crushed the Katie Taylor Mustangs. And now, girls softball. St. Agnes Tigers lost to Lender Lions. St. Pius the Ten Panthers lost against the Tide Havens Tigers. St. John's 23rd Lions lost a close one against Fourth Bend Christian Eagles. And finally, Incarnate Word Falcons were crushed by the Kincaid Falcons. And that's a wrap for this week's sports report for the week of February 26th. Keep your radio tuned to AM 1430 for the next week's recap of Houston Catholic Sports. And now back to you, Wyatt. Valeria, thank you so much for that sports report. We appreciate it. This Friday marks International Women's Day. In celebration, the University of St. Thomas is unveiling a new graduate program that's aimed at better equipping students on the issues of gender and sexuality from a Catholic perspective. So joining us via Zoom to talk more about that is Leah Jacobson. She's the program coordinator for the Nessie Center for Faith and Culture at the University of St. Thomas. She is coming to us via Zoom. She's actually in Minnesota, but she actually is uh, works with students from all over the country who work through the University of St. Thomas. So Leah Jacobson, join us right now. Thank you so much for joining us, Leah. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having us on. Thank you. So like I said, lots going on at the University of St. Thomas. This upcoming Friday for International Women's Day, you guys are going to celebrate the official launch of a graduate certificate in sexuality and gender. So that might, I think in the modern age, uh, Leah, that might be confusing for some people because of what our common culture teaches us about sexuality and gender. How do you approach this subject from an authentic Catholic perspective? Well, I think we have such great news in the Catholic Church about um, the inherent dignity of man and woman and the complementarity of man and woman. And so we get to tell the good news from a Catholic perspective that man and woman were made intentionally. There's no mistakes. Our sexuality is a really good part of who we are. Uh, And so we're excited to launch it on International Women's Day, especially uh, because that's a day where we kind of pause and stop and say, hey, women are different and there's something really special about them. Um, So it's a very fitting day for us to tell the good news about how man and woman are created. So tell me more about this program in particular. How does it break down? What classes do students need to take? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So we're going to start with a a really wonderful human anthropology course, the human person, body and soul, uh, which is that reminder that God doesn't make mistakes. And then we get into a history of gender and sexuality. And that one I'm very excited about. We have Erica Bacchiacci teaching that class, who is just a fabulous um, expert voice in this field right now. And then a social science class, a science and social science of sexuality and gender. Uh, Dr. Amy Hamilton will be teaching that one. And then finally, we have a practical and professional applications course which really is the heart and soul of this program. It's taking this good news out into the world. I think a lot of Catholics are hesitant to speak. We don't know the words. We're afraid to offend. And so we don't say anything. But at this moment, we have to lean in and tell this good news and bring this to the world. So that practical applications course is really the chance for us to practice applying the good news in our professional settings. And I think that's important, too, because in some ways, uh, you know, you're, you're bringing people together, you're uniting the church and, you know, and th- some of this philosophical and spiritual teaching as well, because the University of St. Thomas, and this program in particular, is going to have live online courses. That means you're going to have students from all over, and they're coming together in a community in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be wonderful in a sense as well, because we can pull professors and instructors and expert voices and guest guest lecturers from all over the country as well. When you have this online option, students can come from anywhere, instructors can come from anywhere, and you get to meet in an intimate community uh, to explore these ideas and really, really learn together. 
I know for people who are Catholic all across this country, this kind of idea of studying sexuality and gender from a Catholic perspective makes so much sense because in so many circles now, theology of the body is becoming more and more more prevalent. More people are having talks about theology of the body, trying to understand what it means that that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Are you confident that this is part of that movement that people want to know really what the authentic teaching is? Uh, and so that way, in that sense, we can connect to God. Yeah, absolutely. I think what John Paul II, what his writings in Theology of the Body really kind of sparked was this awareness of how important and integrated our sexuality is to our identity as human beings. It's not something that we can just brush under the rug and ignore. It actually is the way that we're going to live out our purpose on this planet. He made us man and woman for a reason. Theology of the Body was the first time we in the church started talking about that, the fact that we have these you know, gendered bodies. Uh, and now we're really coming to a point where it's critical for us to advance this conversation so that Catholics can understand what that actually looks like in a world that's growing more and more confused, more and more divided, where we're erasing guideposts and markers of male, female, man, woman. Um, the church can really shine bright in this moment to provide clear guidance. Uh, the teachings are trustworthy and it is good, good news. And so this is a very big invitation to everyone in the church to not hide from these issues because we have nothing to be ashamed of. This is the good news the world needs right now. Amen. This graduate certificate is sort of a precursor to a launch of a full master's program. And speaking of good news, we have a little bit of breaking news here. Uh, Leah, tell me, I think you've just uh, now gotten approval for the master's program. We did. It's going to launch. It's going to be the first ever Catholic Women and Gender Studies program in the country. Uh, fall 2024, it's coming to UST. Very good. Excellent. So again, University of St. Thomas New Sexuality and Gender Studies program. We encourage people to check out the website on UST's website for more information. Leah Jacobson, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Again, we thank you so much for being able to listen and watch this program, Catholic Lunch Break. I want to thank all of our guests here on the program. Again, the name of the film, by the way, that we've given away tickets for is Love God's Will. This is Wyatt Goolsby, the executive director, saying stay Catholic, Houston. Have a great week.